Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen here with Alex King and Daniel Mangina. Today is Thursday, February the 6th, 2020, and it's 4 p.m. New York time. Wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us for another episode of LOA Today, your daily dose of happy. And uh, we have really, really happy news today. I mean, we always try to start the shows off in a happy way, but it, this one's going to be tough to top for a long time to come. <laughs> It's just uh, well, you know, it's one of those things. Well, it's once in a lifetime when it works out the way it's supposed to work out, you know. Yeah, so exactly. you really can't top that, except mm-hmm. to say, well, you know, I've been through a similar experience a number of years ago. But I'm not going to, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to spoil it, Alex. I'm going to let you share the news. What has happened this week that has got us all flying high today? Uh, I may or may not be planning a wedding via next year. <laughs> <laughs> October 22nd, 2021. Wow. Everybody, everybody get their suits. It's going to be fabulous. Up. Fabulous. And, and I'll, then, I'll show the ring for people who are watching live stream. And it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Now, this is something that anyone who's been following the podcast for the last uh, year and a half, year and a half. <laughs> has been hearing all the stories about mm-hmm. how not meeting, meeting the right people and how to maintain the right viewpoint and how to keep going despite the odds and I I imagine there may even have been some people who thought we were just talking through our hats but it turns out this actually pays off in the long run yep and that's all she has to say (laughs) she has nothing else to say she's speechless this week folks and well almost whoops she just froze up too oh she's got a call at the news and overjoyed at happiness at the manifestation. Well, sorry, I missed all that. I had a phone call. What? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you have to watch the replay now. I've, I've given them. <laughs> it doesn't happen twice. The, the, truth, <laughs> the truth was at the moment, so. Oh, man. All right. <laughs> I think we just cool. we managed to turn a really happy piece of news into an anticlimax. I didn't <laughs> think that was possible. <laughs> it happens, just, man. It happens. Quick reset. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, yes, it's go. been a long tri- trial and tribulations and all the dating apps. And, <laughs> and it's been a long, long road, but I finally made it to the end. Well, so, not the end yet, but yeah. Well, the next great step, actually. Yes, yes, the next great step. The next Which level, we, as the fiancé would say. <laughs> we, we, well, yeah, that's a good way to say it. Um, mm-hmm. I, one of the things that, of course, you'll be dealing with, you know, all the wedding plans and, and the lists and all the stuff mm-hmm. that you end up going through and, and – uh, if it's anything like anybody else's wedding, you'll be stressing and all that. And the thing to remind yourself as you're going through it all is this is just the celebration of the first day. The rest of it comes right. afterward. Right. Well, that's why I'm starting <laughs> now. So I have plenty of time to delegate amongst everyone. Ah. And I Delegation is the key to de-stressing. So okay. if I don't have to worry about it, not my problem. Well, yeah, that's the right way yeah. to do it. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Now, there are going to be some people who are not yet at the point that you're at and mm-hmm. who are going to want to know a little bit more about what the secret is. I mean, they all know the secret because they're all followers of <laughs> LOA today, but you know, they're going to want to know what, what did you do that worked? Why did this work, do you think? I stayed focused on my goal, and I, I always knew in my mind what my worth was, and I wasn't willing to settle for anything less. So that's I just put it out there, and I let uh, Kenny, my fiancé, know what in the beginning of the relationship, what I was expecting and what he let me know what he was looking for. And we matched. So here we are four months later with a ring. And Daniel was actually cheering you in the background. Did you want to yeah. add on to that, Dan? <laughs> Just celebrating. Just celebrating. celebrating. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the celebration goes on. Well, th- this is an interesting day because we also had set aside time today to talk about Daniel's book uh-huh. but, and, and I mean kind of in a way this is really like the after effect of stepping beyond intentions really mm-hmm. I mean she she set her intentions she stepped beyond them and look where she ended up there we go right <laughs> you're living it and doing it or we could yep. even say that this 
like getting to the space where you were ready to make it happen was what happened. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because you had to be clear and had to be that frequency before you were able to even have that experience of connecting with him. Exactly. So we could really say that that's where the work was done. And now mm -hmm. you're in of living beyond intention. Mm -hmm. By the way, Dan, your, um, your voice is cutting out and in a little bit. If you can get closer to a mic or whatever, make an adjustment, that would be helpful because we usually lose like the first two words of your sentence. So oh, gotta, he's not using a snowball that. today. That's what uh, it is. Oh, uh, okay. That's what it is. Well, he, it worked okay on Tuesday. That was fine. Except for the fact that when he came inside, it disappeared. But today seems to be a better day for, you know, why? I'm right to the, so basically because of the traffic people, traffic noise, I decided to be next to the window, but I actually quite like the backdrop of this. So I get. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> the, the lighting of the sun. <laughs> the backdrop of the backdrop. And the, <laughs> the outside without the noise. Got it. And the noise was interesting yesterday. There was, there was a bird, I believe, in particular that was mm -hmm. um, chiming in, not yesterday, but Tuesday, was chiming mm -hmm. in regularly and basically yeah. adding his or her opinion. Yeah, I just really wanted to, you know, Source just wanted to express itself through a bird. That I day. guess so, yeah. <laughs> At this level of consciousness, who are we to say that a bird does not have something to say about Ella Way? Oh, I, I had personal it. experience with it, actually. I mean... I, I'm like 98% confident that on one particular occasion while Louise and I were still living in Virginia, um, I was visited by a bird and I'm 98% sure it was my dad coming back to say hello because I was mowing the lawn and that was one of his favorite things to do. So this was his way, way of saying hello. And the reason I figured it was an actual visitation like that was because it was a morning dove who had no compunction about the fact that I was sitting on this massive rider mower and was standing like three feet away from me and looking <laughs> with the mower running, you know, wow. that, that would normally bird. drive a bird away, you know, and this right. is like kind of looking at me like, okay, well, do you recognize me? <laughs> <laughs> we could say that really, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at signs a lot recently and ex exploring their meaning and space. And at the end of the day, everything can be a sign that informs us if we believe it's a sign that informs us. Right. That so, is precisely true. Yes. Right. Your, your dad, having crossed over, returned to pure energy, right? And so everything is available for the energy to express itself in a message to you. Mm -hmm. It just isn't caught in the moment. Now, actually, the tricky part is being both aware enough and having a clear enough signal that you know when you're getting signaled because there's just so much stuff that we deal with every day, so many interfaces that we have that, okay, well, how do I know it was that bird? <laughs> yeah, you got to tweak your filters. Belief. belief. For me, it always just comes down to believe the stories that we overlay on the experience give us the mm -hmm. opportunity to talk about what it is. Yep, I agree. That's true. Mm -hmm. So. Well, be, we, before we get into the book, should we? Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to bring in about this uh, wonderful piece of news you have, Alex? Or should we go into the book? What do you want to know? I mean, basically everything is legitimately planned. Like, what do you? <laughs> <laughs> I was not messing around. <laughs> well, you know, realize that there there isn't like an irony in there. You gave yourself a year and a half to plan for something that's already planned. Mm -hmm. Well, now I just have to pay for everything, and you know, well, not <laughs> me personally, but you know, things have to be paid for. Uh, dresses have to be delivered. Bridesmaids and groomsmen and all that have to get their stuff together, all that, yeah, fun stuff. So is this where Asperger's actually plays a positive role for you? Actual factuals. Because it, it keeps you Asperger's. extremely focused. <laughs> yes, it does keep you focused. <laughs> like I've already done, what did I do last night? Last night I stayed up late and I did the, uh, the, the whole list, the, the uh, invite list. I've already. What, huh? What? No, I was about to say something, but I'll text you off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you had us on pins and needles. Yeah. I know, we were like that. <laughs> I, I, recorded, I was recording earlier uh, with a friend of mine, and um, I was like, oh, yeah. We had a conversation beforehand that's like, yeah, not everything's going to be said on podcast. I was like, oh, yeah, I need to, like, I'm going to text you about that after. Cause okay. <laughs> Gotcha, gotcha. 
Oh my gosh. Well, I don't know what else to add then. I mean, I mean, if you've got it all figured out, you can just, you know, tell us what we need to know and we're done because <laughs> you've got to go. Well, like I said, the date is set. So, uh, October 22nd next year. Uh, let me see what else. The bachelor bachelorette party is going to be a joint party is going to be on my birthday weekend that year. So, you know, Oh wow. It's, so it's like a week long celebration situation. Mm-hmm. Um, the venue has an indoor water park. So that's going to be fun. Wow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Wow. And the colors are purple, black, and silver. Wow, wow, wow. All right, I, I have to ask. You guys aren't going to, like, you know, exchange vows on the way down the water slide, are you? No. <laughs> the water slide is for the after the party after. It the is. Well, I'm just, I'm just checking. I'm just <laughs> checking, you know. No, no, no. Like, I'm traditional, <laughs> but, like, low-key, like, some things are modern, you know? <laughs> right? You you expect me to get my hair wet? Are you serious right <laughs> now? Riding in a unicorn? Hello? <laughs> Riding in a unicorn. <laughs> carriage unicorn, horse and carriage, right? No, the most unicorn I could have in the world. I don't know. I might get a unicorn tiara. I wouldn't be surprised. Dang, I just had an horse idea. With unicorn yeah. people. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. This with unicorn colors. I know it's planned, but I'm seeing the future and it's unicorn. <laughs> Well, I had to compromise because he's actually one of the types that want input in the wedding. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. I guess. <laughs> we, can, we can have one of your colors then, I guess. <laughs> so I'll do 99% and you get 1%. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, but this is my day. He's like, it's my day too. I was like, who raised you? Like, <laughs> your part's done. Like, just, just show up. <laughs> Just show up and hand me the checks. Like, that's all you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. This is going to be a day to remember. I can tell already. <laughs> oh, and something else you might want to know. For those of you who know the history with my whole father and the whole father walking down the aisle thing, I'm actually mm. going to have both my brothers walk me down the aisle. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a good, so good solution. Nice. Very, mm-hmm. very nice. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, actually, that was an interesting story in our wedding because Louise's father was in the last three months of his life when we mm, got married. Mm-hmm. And he was determined to walk his daughter down the aisle. Right. He was in really bad health. In fact, uh, I think it was about a week before he was in the hospital. Mm-hmm. And his instruction to the doctor was, I don't care what you do. I need to be at my daughter's wedding. Mm-hmm. And the doctor replied, no problem. We'll juice you up and you'll be ready to go. <laughs> he literally used that phrase. We'll juice you up. Right. And they were putting all these fluids into him and everything. I mean, they were just, they were juicing him up. They were basically giving him the best ability that he could possibly have to be able to mm-hmm. walk down the aisle. And, and this is for a guy who basically was not in walking condition, mm-hmm. but he did it. I, and it was a little bit precarious because it was actually both him and her stepmother Mm-hmm. On either side of her, walking down this narrow aisle. So you have three people mm-hmm. in this narrow aisle. One of them is about to fall over. The mm. other one is fortunately not a really big person, so that they could squeeze in there. And my wife is in the middle, or actually my fiance at that point, is in the middle, trying to guide them both very carefully <laughs> down this aisle. But they made yeah. it. They got there. Yeah. It all, no injuries were reported. You know, it was good. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. That's a nice story. Well, that's one of the other funny thing, not funny, one of the fun things about weddings because, well, I think you're already planning a few of them, but there are going to be some unplanned things that happen that kind of define the whole event. Oh, I know. I helped my, plan my sister's wedding, so I'm well aware of the unawareables. <laughs> and, and the unawareables, yeah, it's a good description yeah. for them. And they're great because they're the things you remember more than anything else. Not that the other stuff isn't memorable. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I think probably the most uh, vivid, would you call it? What was the phrase you used? Unawareables. An unawareable, yes. And the most vivid unawareable uh, for our wedding was that when Louise was driven to the site by the limo driver, she was driven in a limo that apparently was not in perfect mechanical condition. Ooh. <laughs> to the point where when they got to the location, um, she wanted to be let off at a particular place because it would be easier with her dress and so forth to get mm-hmm. in there. 
And in order to do that, the driver had to go around this really tight corner, couldn't quite do it, and needed to back up. And that's when the mechanical problem emerged because Ugh. it turned out the limo did not have a reverse. What? <laughs> Reverse oh was not working for this particular transmission. <laughs> so she gets on her, on her phone and calls my brother, who is my best man, yeah, and says, Mark, I need your help. I need you to get a bunch of guys down here to push the limousine backward. <laughs> so my very communicative brother says nothing to me except to say, don't worry, everything's okay, and then right. takes all the men out of the audience and leaves. <laughs> yeah, that's not suspect at all. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few people missing. <laughs> we, we we did get photos. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. And yeah, all these guys in their tuxes pushing the limo backward. It was really something. oh, that must be a great photo. <laughs> so that was our most memorable um, takeaway from the day we got married. My <laughs> well, that was ours. I, actually, our audiences, mm -hmm. uh, a large portion of our guest list were friends of mine from the swing dance community in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So we had a fabulous floor show. Um, Cause we, right. had some, we had some of the best dancers in the state mm -hmm. and you know, the audience were loving it, which was great. And what, and I was a little bit worried too, because when you have people who really know what they're doing, it can kind of be intimidating to other people, but that's not the way people took it. People right. took it like, Oh wow, I want to go do this too. I have no idea what I'm doing. How does this work? <laughs> <laughs> well, swing dancing does that for you. It, it makes can. you feel. It makes you want to feel in, included. Yeah, so that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Daniel's already into it. You can just see he's making up steps as we're talking. <laughs> I love it. So. All right. Well, then we can get into the book. Uh, before we do, I'll do a couple of promotional announcements. Just reminders. First of all, if you're not yet a member of the Law of Attraction Pivot Pals group, become a member and share your vignettes, as Cindy Chavez and I talk call them. Um, you know, whatever it is you're trying to do, like, you know, finding a mate and getting married, for instance, could be one of them. Um, just, you know, I don't know where that one came from, but, <laughs> but it can be anything that you're trying to attract into life. And, and the best part is you, you're doing it in a group that is a closed group and it's all people who are listeners of the show. So it's a very supportive atmosphere. You're not going to get a lot of people, you know, saying, Oh, don't go after that. You're setting your sights too low. You're not going to get any of that kind of thing. It's yeah, just there's no it's a negativity. very supportive thing. So, you know, come on in and join us and, and, do what the smart ones are doing. The smart ones are coming back on a daily basis and revisiting their vignette, revisiting it and playing it in their mind and, and basically building up the vibration of it, building up their belief in it. And that's, that's really what works. So join us. We hope you do that. Also become a subscriber. If you're not yet a subscriber, most of you are, but just in case a few of you are not and are not sure how to do it, we've made it really simple. Just go to the homepage of our website, loatoday.net. And at the top of the page, you will find instructions that are basically one or two, maybe three clicks away from becoming a subscriber. And then after that, you're a subscriber. All the episodes come streaming to your device just like that. And you can also, like Alex said, you can see us on YouTube. You can actually see Alex's ring. Just go to YouTube for that, right? Tell me, <laughs> where can they find your ring on YouTube? Tell them about that. Well, if they go to YouTube, they can search LOA Today podcast videos. And once you've done that, you will see our smiling faces. Down below, hit the red subscribe button. Next to the red subscribe button, there's a silver bell. Click that silver bell and make sure you click all so you will always be notified when we are live. Daniel doing his great Vanna White impersonation in the background. <laughs> yeah. Thank you again, because there's two of you, and I can see the yellow thing flicking back and forth. Seriously, Alex, Tuesday was very precarious without you. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the green oh, thing's oh. like, it's always on you. So. I was muting it before I did my dance, but there was a lot, a lot that went into it. You know. Well, I'm glad you missed me, guys. <laughs> All right, so Stepping Beyond Intentions, which was a book that you wrote. When did you write this one, Daniel? Oh, gosh, I released it in September, but I've been working on it for a decade. For a decade. Wow. Yeah. So this is a book that had a lot of thought put into it. I mean, a year and a half planning for a wedding is nothing compared to this. <laughs> there was, there was, this was dropped four or five of the books. Um, mm. so it went on the shelf, came off the shelf. I'd actually released it in 2018 in August and then took it off the shelf the next day. I was like, nope, it's not ready. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, how so do you come to the conclusion that it wasn't ready? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. So there's a different level to this because initially when I first started to write 
the book, it was actually called Not That You Care. Okay. I actually like that title. <laughs> and, um, it was more of a, a, a sob story. It was very victim. Mm. Because oh. I was about what I'd use beyond intention to shift out of my life than empowering people with beyond intention. It was like a sub story where it was me thing. Mm. So that. And then I, I knuckled down and got really a lot clearer on beyond intention, the four steps and meted those out. And then I spent the next, I'd say, uh, I'd say probably the next eight or nine years getting beyond intention solid, not for other people, but for me. Right. So I shared with other people and then it got to the point where people asked me about using it and people encouraged me to do the speaking. And then I made the transition from my old life in finance over to what I do now. And in the space of that transition, I did a draft, but it was a textbook that had no soul. So that wasn't very good. It's like, here's a step-by-step guide on how to make your attention. And it was just <laughs> no soul to it. Mm-hmm. So then I redrafted it and told a lot of stories, but then it, it wasn't coherent. It wasn't, it wasn't coherent. It was very messy. Mm-hmm. And then I did another draft that felt like it was okay, but there was, there was just pieces missing. It just, there was just pieces that weren't, it just wasn't, it, it wasn't, it wasn't. Yeah. Was it clicking? This is my baby, you know, and it wasn't ready to, I didn't feel that baby was properly dressed going out. The <laughs> that was August, August 2018. And then I realized what I had to do. I realized that I had to actually tell my story and weave in more about beyond intention where it came from, but not so much that people can't apply. So it's finding that fine line between giving you enough background so you understand how to apply it for yourself and the power of mm-hmm. it, but then also the mechanics, the behind the scenes mechanics. And so what I ended up doing was basically redoing it to take the meat of um, my Beyond Intention introduction to the program, which is my audio program about teaching people the basics of Beyond Intention. Mm-hmm. But then adding some structure to it, I speak about the flow funnel in the book, which is a really important um, component to the application of Beyond Intention and how to actually set intentions and then what to do in that space between intentions and, and, and actually having the experience and, and a much cleaner narrative. So I had that and I'd laid in an autobiographical element. This was March of 2019. Mm-hmm. And then I realized I wasn't quite ready to be as vulnerable as I'd been in that particular draft. It was a much bigger volume than this one, probably twice as long. And so I made a commitment to tell the vulnerable pieces of the story at another time when I am ready to share those conversations I don't want to have with my mom right now. And then instead, uh, I stripped it down to the autobiographical elements that actually assist with understanding the pieces, cut it down to about 30,000 words, and then I got that edited, proofread, and all that kind of good stuff, and then we got that out in September. Nice. Okay. So that's actually not all that different from the way many writers write. That's, mm-hmm. you know, that, that kind of fits. So, mm-hmm. yeah, well, well done, first of all, in pulling it off the shelf when it wasn't ready. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. not an easy call to make, but you did, and you know it made a difference, I'm sure. So, yeah, so it's really, I mean, we've got some, we've had some really, really great reviews of the book. Um, I have one good read on Amazon. People are really applying it and actually getting stuff from it. It's, it's mm-hmm. actually doing something. You know, there was the um, there was an egoic element that also added to to taking pauses before to really keep it a pure, pure representation of the work that I wanted to share with you all, because this is essentially my, this is the, 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 the debutante ball for my book. <laughs> my work, you know, the book was a debutante ball. So people listen to the podcast and stuff, but the book, that's now a permanent record yeah. of, you know, for all time effectively. So, right. so it's, you know, and I'm, I've got the levels for like the next six, so, the next expansion on the sharing of the work book wise now is really setting clean. The next, it's going to be the blueprint. And then after that, I'm going to do a book on alchemic life creation. And then after that, a book on lucid living, which is the, the evolution. I like that be- order. It's a funny thing to say in the electronic age where everything is done with video and audio and online and so forth. Mm-hmm. But I don't think there is anything 
quite as effective as the written word to make the person who's doing the expressing sound like an author, to sound like I really know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I think it's partly because it takes a lot more work to do a book. I mean, it, it, podcast by comparison is simple. Uh, even a video by, by comparison is simple. But when you write a book, it's a real time and energy commitment. And mm -hmm. so I think there's kind of like a subconscious element that goes on in most people's minds that basically says, okay, well, if they wrote this, this must be what they really, really know, not the stuff that they're just spouting off about. So I think it has more credibility. Mm, interesting. I read, I read that to it. And I think also it's just that there's a, there's a more formulaic presentation to a book than there is to videos. Video True. series all the time. But there's a, there's a way that our brain processes words in, compared to listening to something and your focus. I mean, you can listen to uh, um, an audio as you're walking along or in the gym. You could do the same with just having the audio from a video, right? You, mm -hmm. you can do it, especially if someone's talking, you don't need to see them. With a book, you're sitting down, you're actually committing time and energy to connecting with that content. You, if you're having a conversation with that book. When you when I was writing, I, I, I imagine myself actually sitting some, there with someone in their private personal space and instructing them from afar and, and mm -hmm. supporting them from afar. And that's what, that's the spirit that I wanted to carry in the book when I, when I, when I, when I do you feel like you succeeded? I'm not going to try to judge that for you. What do you think? Do you think you got there? From what I've heard back so far, yes. Um, I'm ready to go to the next stage. Even people that have been doing my work, and this is what is really interesting, people that have been doing my work that have been to, so a woman who's at my deep dive coaching weekend a couple of weeks ago here in Los Cabos, she, this is her second retreat of mine that she's been to, and she's done some coaching with me, but she's mm -hmm. still got some work. All right. Okay. That's good. So, in November, read the book after, and it's like it, it just tied pieces together. Mm -hmm. Gave him that structure to apply what he what he did. So, yeah, I believe he has done that. Okay, well, good. Well, normally when we do book reviews, we, we we normally actually read passages from the book and then talk about different passages. I get the feeling in this case that's probably not our best play. I think our best play is to have you tell the story kind of ad hoc rather than reading it to us because mm. that way it's it's fresher it's more it's more you coming through so start the start us off you're in the introduction what are you telling us about in the introduction what we're doing in in, in the in, in the, the early part of the book is just setting the scene for the fact that beyond intention is about understanding that Life, as we experience it, is the result of what we're intending, whether consciously or unconsciously. But bringing about a conscious expression requires taking an active conscious role in what we're intending and therefore creating. So we're not allowing ourselves to fall into the full prey to allowing our subconscious patterns to, to be the, the storyteller, not allowing our past lives or our soul contracts or our parents' programs, none of that. We're saying that regardless of what the lay of the land is, regardless of what the narrative has been till now, here I'm taking the step into choosing, disrupting the unconscious and making our choice a conscious decision about where we're going to go next. Mm -hmm. And that this will empower you to be able to start doing that consistently. And based on what you were saying a few minutes ago, this was basically you sharing what you'd learned out of your own experience. So there was a storyline that kind of went along with that, right? Uh, I don't go so much into three here because so the thing is, one, the fine line that needed to be walked for me, I wasn't ready to walk it yet emotionally. Ah, is, okay. Because when we tell, when we speak of disempowering situations that we've been in, if we're not ready to sit and hold that fire in a conscious way, we can end up reconnecting to those experiences and allowing that energy back into our life now. Also, there are, for me personally, as something that I battled with over the years is the egoic need to share about what I've overcome, not to support people, but to show how good I am. Mm -hmm. and, be mm -hmm. and as I sat with it, I was like, I don't really feel clean, and that's where I'm coming from here. So I, I left the story part out until 
I really feel confident in the work that I've continued to do with myself that the energy that I'm conveying through the book is a very clean energy. So I've touched on pieces of the story, but I've kept it really, really tight. What we've really more done is gone in the narrative of how to set intentions, the important pieces that need to be at play before we go and set intentions. And then once we've got that intention, how do we bring it to life? How do we create that alignment with it so that we can have the experience? And that's the narrative that the book goes through. Which is unusual. I mean, usually when you have a, a, a nonfiction type presentation where they're mixing together stories with factual presentation, usually it's fact, story, fact, story, fact, story. And you're kind of breaking that pattern up. You're going fact, 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 story. I'd say story, fact, 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 story, fact, 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 story, fact, story, fact, story, pow. That's <laughs> in that <laughs> order. <laughs> I've, I've checked. That's exactly what it is. I don't mind. Um, so it's yeah, just weaving in when there was a story that was relevant to understanding enough of the background to that step so that you can see why it's applicable. So, for example, when I'm speaking about um, clearing, I'm speaking about personal experiences with cutting energy ties. Um, I've got a lot. What I've actually did a lot more of was giving case studies to people that I've worked with in my work who've used moon intention. So it's not just me. This is how this person used it for this, and this is what the result was, et cetera, et cetera. So the, um, the, the next book in the series, The Blueprint, is going to be a little bit more story-led. There's going to be a lot more case studies in there, uh, specifically on going through um, the application of moon intention called the, the Ideal Life Blueprint, which is what the book's going to all be about. Um, and then the Alchemic Life Creation piece is going to be more uh, conversational. So I'm, I'm actually in the process of interviewing experts in the fields around the, the elements of our chemical life creation. And much like um, a recent book I've just been reading, The Power of Eight, where the book is actually her showing her getting to the answers mm-hmm. and going and they're finding the answers. I'm almost um, fact checking the alchemic life creation piece with experts in the field and discussing that in the book and therefore teaching some of the elements of it. So that's what we're doing with that. Okay. So then take us uh, back toward the beginning of your book. Not, maybe not the very beginning because you laid out you know, some of the ideas at first, but uh, tie us into one or two of the stories that you told in the book and, and show us how you use that story to illustrate your points. So there was a, um, it was a really interesting experience I had in October of 2018. I'd, um, I'd, been in an interesting relationship dynamic for a while, like a very, very interesting relationship dynamic. And I'd been trying to bring an end to that on really good terms for more than a year. Um, and it just wasn't, it, it just wasn't, wasn't working. <laughs> like, no, nope, you're not going anywhere. You're staying. <laughs> you work it out. <laughs> but only one person wants to fight. <laughs> um, and then what I, what happened was, is that I was, I was in a, I was in a, I was in Florida. I was teaching a workshop down in Florida and I was with a friend and we we're drinking a glass of wine and just talking about life and all sorts of good stuff. And then, uh, I said something. I said one line. I said, because you can't have anything, everything in a relationship. It just slipped out. I wasn't, I, I, I don't know where it came from. Yikes. My friend was like, what did you just say? <laughs> And I was actually just, she was, um, we were together in Dubai. I know through the work of Dr. Joe Dispenza. She's actually in his team, uh, his event coordination team. And, uh, I'm so grateful for that awareness coming from the outside because I would have completely missed it. I didn't. Mm-hmm. And who knows how many other times I've been in, in conversation where I've said similar things, similar, mm-hmm. disimpar- similar signs to what patterns I was running on that I didn't hear. And this goes to listen, um, step forward when the person is listen. Which is thinking and feeling, thinking and, um, and, and living with awareness. And also being conscious of the environment that we create and the people, places and things that we populate it with. Are they supporting who we want to be? In that instance, I demonstrated that I had actually in my environment someone who supported how I wanted to show up because when I was showing up in that moment out of alignment with how I wanted to be, the space of disempowerment, not seeing that I was limiting myself, that mirror came back and let me know, Hey, bro. Yeah. I mean, and in the, from where I'm sitting, that sounds to me like inner being coming through. 
basically saying, okay, here's my moment. I'm going to, in, God bless you. So I'm going Thank to you. insert, you know, the, the fact that Daniel has been kind of missing this, but uh, since I'm Daniel, it's okay for me to point it out. So I'm going to point out to myself that I've been uh, missing this and the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to do it in a, in a way that my, uh, uh, my other is going to say, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Yeah, so that exactly. it comes to the fore. And uh, again, I'm a fan in hologram theory, uh, which is something I speak more about in alchemic life creation work, which is basically the, the viewpoint that everything that we experience is just a holographic reflection of our state of being made manifest as an illusion that we experience as our world. And so for me, every single piece of my environment, going back to what we were saying earlier about science, I honestly believe that every single piece of my environment is offering me signs and guidance to support me in my intentions. And I back that up with having the intention to live in a, joy, a joyful, abundant, purpose-driven life with other pieces to it. But that's what I choose. And so when I act or make the choice unconsciously to act in a manner that doesn't align with that, that my world takes care of me and gives me signs to that effect. In this instance, the hey, bro. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, yeah, the funny thing was is that after a year of trying to do things matter to matter, three dimensionally, and sitting down, having talks, and negotiating, and all this kind of stuff, that um, I realized. So what happened is once I had that, we unpacked it, and I then took a reflect, uh, I took stock of my life, and I realized that I had been playing out this story that you can't be happy. I. Th- uncovered what was underneath it, which is what I didn't really believe in the existence of happiness in the relationship anyway. And so mm. obviously my subconscious programs are going to be playing out that reality truth, right? Mm-hmm. That illusion that that's not the case. And when I caught it, I didn't have to go and do a year of shadow work. I just had to make the choice that I didn't want to do that anymore. Right. And within, within a week she she disappeared. She just left. She just up to left. <laughs> And that happened because I was no longer a match for it vibrationally because I made the conscious choice to disrupt who I was and show up as who I actually want to be. Mm -hmm. So much of the heavy lifting is done just by making the choice to be aligned with something else. But that starts with having a clear intention and then making the choice to show up as that new frequency. And that's what Beyond Intention really is. It's at the Beyond Intention level, it's choosing what we're going to experience and choosing to be aligned to it. When we get a bit deeper in with alchemic life creation and there's living, there's other things that we're choosing, but it comes down to a choice and recognizing that we do have the power to choose. Stories that say that we can't are not truth and that actually if we're ready to muck in and do the work a little bit, we can change the patterns of choosing things that we don't want. Mm. So uh, from the from the perspective of what you write in the book, why do we so often end up not you know, spending, or let me phrase it differently, spending so much time avoiding identifying what our choice is. And when we do finally get to the point where we make the choice, why do we keep stumbling around so much? Because we, we haven't chosen. This is, I think one thing that we, we, we do, and this is one of the things that I talk about a lot, is we, we tell ourselves these stories to romanticize the fact that we just haven't made the bloody choice. Uh-huh. Right? Because we get exactly what we are. And law of attraction is we get more of what we are. So if you want to know what you are, look at what you're experiencing because your environment does not lie. One of the things I would say is the mind, the subconscious mind will never lose. You're not going to beat it. And your environment does not lie. So when people say, I don't want this, I don't want that, this isn't what I want to experience, I laugh inside, not to their face because sometimes it's a sad situation. But I laugh because the fact of the matter is, is that your subconscious mind does not lose. So if you're experiencing something that you don't desire, you do desire it, just not at a conscious level. And it's separating conscious desire, unconscious desire, and superconscious desires, which is when we start to come back with soul level. But all of them are under our dominion consciously if we choose to step into that seat, that 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 throne. And beyond intention, again, is about making the choice to step into that seat of dominion and accept it doesn't matter what my soul contracts are. I can still choose differently. It yeah. doesn't matter what programs were. I can choose differently. It's just sometimes we need to muck in a little bit deeper in order to break those patterns and actually make the choice to move beyond it. But we always have a choice. 
And to use the terminology you're using there, it, I think probably the one thing that trips us up more than anything else is not recognizing that the choice has to be conscious. We have to actually yeah. make a con it has to be something that, okay, I'm aware of it as I'm sitting here and talking to Daniel and to Alex, I am aware I need to make this choice. And here's what the options are. I even know right. what the options, I have to say what those are. I have to make it yeah. that clear to myself because otherwise, well, I'll just kind of leave them in the background. Like, well, yeah, yeah, I know what they are. I know what they are. <laughs> I, I never really verbalize them. I never really say what they are. Just like, oh, yeah, well, I know what they are. They're over there. <laughs> I mean, I was having this conversation with Olga um, a couple of nights ago about the difference between knowing something and doing something about it. Mm. You can know all you want. Mm. You can be aware of all you want. If you're not doing something different with that information, you will just stay the same. You may have the apparition of difference for a little while. You may have a shimmering difference in perspective. In the world, but the actual change cannot show up unless you show up differently because we're experiencing what we're vibrationally matched to. Information doesn't change our vibration. It informs, it, it changes the potentials for the vibration, but it doesn't change the vibration. Making the conscious choice to be a different vibration is the only thing that's gonna give us a different experience. So when people are procrastinating or, um, you know, they, they end up slipping back in, it's because they haven't made the firm choice. They just haven't made the firm choice. And the second that we stop judging ourselves for not having made the firm choice, Except that we haven't made the firm choice and then actually muck in and make the firm choice. That's just going to be what we experience. It's, it's the law. And it makes sense. I mean, we actually, Louise and I uh, went through a little iteration of that right after we got back from vacation. I was mm -hmm. telling you about this on uh, Tuesday, Daniel, how uh, we got back and almost instantly fell back into our old patterns. Now we'd just been on this wonderful trip, had all these great things happening. We were flying high. We were feeling really good. We come back and, we're right back where we were just before we left. I mean, it was like the trip had never happened. Why? Because we would just fallen into that pattern. We went with the default and we had to recognize it and say, Oh my God, we're not going to keep doing this anymore. <laughs> and we literally did that. We actually sat down with each other and said, we're not doing this anymore. We're going to shake this up. And we started talking about how are we going to shake this up? What are we going to do differently? What are we going to think about differently? What are we going to, you know, how are we going to program ourselves differently? Mm -hmm. All the different ways that we can shake things up. Uh, and, and one of the things we ended up focusing on was the fact that you don't have to change a lot. You just have to change. Right. You just have to shake it up. I mean, I love Cindy Chavez's uh, analogy. If, if you don't have any money and you don't have any friends and you don't have any place to go, rearrange the furniture. Yep. Just do something, you know, mm -hmm. shake it up. Because mm -hmm. when you do, things start to happen. You start to get different results. You start to get, like you said, Daniel, a different vibration. It starts to it starts to uh, be a different experience from what it was five minutes ago, just mm -hmm. by shaking it up. I have this, um, I have this with, um, um, so it's really funny. I did a post the other day, uh, some stats from my micro to millions program, because we've been going for a year now. And, um, it was just for the last couple of months, I've been just interviewing people and getting where they're at and so on. So we've got some stats and I posted the stats. And it was really interesting to see that some people who backed dropped out of the program earlier on, commenting or responding to the post or even though I can see they've seen it but not not even acknowledging that the post right. you, know, when you can see who's seen the post and what have you and um, it was funny because one of the things that people used as a reason excuse for backing <laughs> out was because micro to is it's, it's based on micro shifts so the first six months you're not going to see massive in terms of what I was pointing out I wasn't telling you how to make a million dollars I was showing, okay, let's get stable. Let's show you how to get to zero. Mm -hmm. Let's have a that you can get to 100 or 200. And people are like, I don't need $200. I need, you know, 20,000 to pay off my student debt or I need 100,000 to do this. Sorry, this program is not for me. I'm like, well, mm -hmm. the whole point is creating that foundation so that you can move on and go and get the big right. moon. And I think... That micro shifting element, when applied even to this conversation you said about the furniture, is, is very much the same. It's that we sometimes t fall into this illusionary trap that a little thing isn't worth doing, when actually often it's the smallest hinges that open the biggest doors. Mm. Right? It's that small action, or even just being ready to take that small action, that makes that energetic commitment to your own timeline and therefore facilitates you being able to have something different. 
the energetic commitment of saying, do you know what? It all looks hopeless, but I'm still moving towards my goal can be that call to the universe. I'm ready for that miracle to be open. That all that stuff I've been calling in that's sitting in my vortex, that moving of the furniture could be representative of moving that block out of the way or moving yourself underneath that vortex of opportunity so that it falls and you can experience it in your life. I think it's very important. This is one of the things I, I talk about so much. It's do not see anything as small. No right. choices, no act as small, no word as small, no thought as small. Respect the power of every single thing in your environment and you imbue it with the power that it can start to transform your environment as a whole. So move that furniture. I love that. Move that furniture. If everything looks dire, bleak, like there's nothing to do, move the furniture. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that I can do, but I can do this right now. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's very powerful in the long run. It doesn't, you, all you get the first day is the furniture moved around. Mm-hmm. But in the long run, when you keep doing it, you start to see results. And actually, as you were talking about that, it, it, I was reminded of a Dr. Dispenza story, which I'm sure, Daniel, you know really well from uh, the book, You Are the Placebo. He tells it toward the end. It's the story of a 19-year-old woman named Lori who has a degenerative bone disease uh, that just manifested out of thin air. And she's got a broken femur and doesn't even know it. And and as time goes on, the, the disease gets worse and worse. And she is tried up before like 10 doctors in a row, all of whom tell her that she has to become sedentary for the rest of her life. And it's incurable and there's nothing that she can do about it. And then uh, she learns after about 10, 15 years in, she, she gets into a dispenser course and learns that this uh, very likely was influenced in her mind by bad experiences she had with her father, who was physically abusive. And mm. it actually turns out this became a way for her to guarantee that she would never be physically abused because she was fragile. And so yeah. if you're fragile, there's, he's not going to abuse you. And in fact, he doesn't. He actually sends her to more and more doctors. Mm-hmm. You know, so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And mm. my point in bringing up this story is it took her 30 years to overcome this thing. Wow. Because she had so much programming built up about how she was not only fragile, but handicapped. And there were a number of benefits that came with being handicapped. True. And she, did, she didn't want to give those benefits up. Now they were giving her power for the first time in her life. She wasn't mm. going to go away from those. But nevertheless, somehow, in some way, she managed to just keep doing the work that Spencer told her to do on herself, on her mind, on her thinking, even though she didn't believe any of it was going to be worth it. She didn't really believe it was going to help, but... What the hell? She didn't have anything else to do. She might as well do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so literally you talk about micro shifting. She micro shifted a tiny millimeter at a time over a course of years until finally the day came when the doctor called her up and said, after like dozens of fractures and micro fractures showing up, her body was free of fractures. All of her bones were healthy. Mm-hmm. Only wow. to be given a phone call. Uh, I guess it was a month later or a week later or something like that from another doctor saying, well, we just did the blood work and you still have a disease. <laughs> and now <laughs> she's still having to do more micro shifting to keep oh, getting man. out of it until finally she gets to the point where she has to go do another medical test after having done all this work on herself and mm-hmm. done a lot of believing and, and had a major breakthrough where she could just feel that old persona melting away, breaking up into pieces and melting away. And then, uh, like I said, she, she gets to this point where this, okay, there's this one more blood test to take to see, well, has she finally rid herself of the, of the disease and she can't face it. So she puts it off for a month and then she goes to do it and she goes to do it with the idea of, well, doesn't matter. I don't care what the results are. I'm just going to go and get it done and I'm just going to be happy with who I am. And, you know, if I'm, I still have a disease and I still have a disease and there's nothing I can do about that, but I'm just going to keep being who I am. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that she, the, the disease is gone. So she nice. went through this long, long, I mean, the book takes 16 pages to tell this story. This is, you know, <laughs> a, your typical Neville Goddard story takes a page, maybe half a page, something like this. This is 16 pages long, you know, just to tell this story. But it shows, and I, I love this story for this reason, it shows everything you go through when you're up against the wall with something that is seemingly impossible and just... You're, you're, it's almost like you're fighting yourself trying to figure out how the heck am I going to do this crazy stuff that they talk about on the radio shows and on the podcasts and on the in the books and in the workshops that I know can't possibly work. How do I keep myself going? Well, she mm. found a way to keep herself going, and it worked. Mm. Yeah, I think a lot of us suffer from uh, 
instant gratification disease because like we if we don't get instant gratification we're like nah it's not for me i'm out <laughs> it happens all the time and i think that's the struggle that dan has with a lot of his uh a lot of his followers they're like oh it's not gonna work overnight yeah i don't have time but do, but is it is it instant gratification or is it a part is or is it a a, a reason or um, a justification to stay where you are both i think the mind's always the, the mind's job is to keep things the same like mm -hmm. the safety okay give me the program i'm going to run with it and if we haven't properly programmed the mind to give it a new program it's going to keep one's part of the new program so when something comes in that can shift it it's like yeah we're not we're not doing that and here's, right. the, here's, the, <laughs> here's the response here's the typewritten um gratification is required mm -hmm. you give it and, uh, I'll see you back on your life. <laughs> facts, man, facts. <laughs> nice try, mate. Good joke. <laughs> it's like the body and the white blood cells fighting off, you know, things they don't recognize. That's exactly what it is. Exactly the same. Exactly the same. Mm -hmm. so, sorry. So if micro shifting is the key. I, Especially if you're one of those people who were, you know, the instant gratification folks, as Alex describes it, your first question is probably going to be, well, then how long is this going to take? Mm -hmm. How long is it going to take? Mm -hmm. So long as you're, so long as you're not making the choice for it to be done, you're going to be in the river of change. It's like one thing that I, I witnessed a lot, especially if I'm spending more time in spiritual communities and, you know, this kind of community, whatever, it's, oh, I'm just in the river of change. Oh, <laughs> I just, I just uncovered another layer for this. I'm going to go deep into the work. I need to spend some time in the shadows. It's my dark night of the soul. <laughs> That's another big one. <laughs> or you could use the blank slate of the now and imprint it with just being happy now. Would you like mm -hmm. some happiness now? <laughs> but I recognize, I recognize that we have to, we often have to, was it Tony Robbins says, um, I think it's Tony Robbins. Someone's quoted me on this now. It's really, it's, it's really funny. Quick segue. I've said this a couple of times. A friend of mine couldn't find the Tony Robbins source. So she just like made a quote of me saying it. I'm like, <laughs> thanks, but I got it from Tony. But change yeah. doesn't take time. Change it's getting ready to make the change that takes time. Mm. How committed are you to still being the same person? The second that you're ready to let go of that commitment to be who you are today, you can make the transition into being someone else. Moment to moment, we're offered the opportunity for a blank slate to create anything that we desire. But our desires are going to be informed with who we are at the moment. So if we're not ready to make that leap as who we are now, then we're going to keep repeating the same thing. Mm -hmm. So what we're micro shifting was creating a compound effect of commitment to the new state of being till we reach that, that point where we do have enough strength, enough leverage over self to let go of the old and step fully into the new. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the, um, the specialness of Lori's story because Lori was faced with having to try to create a blank slate combined with zero belief that it was going to work and yeah. that's not easy to do right and she had a lot to unpack oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> i mean that's that's a tough mm -hmm. game right there because mm -hmm. you know it, it, it's a little bit easier to try to imagine okay i'm going to attract a parking place because you know there's at least a decent chance you're going to get one anyway you know right, so, right. so you can kind of you know you, you you can justify it in your mind. You know, overcoming a disease that your doctors all tell you you can't overcome because it's incurable. That's a different kettle of fish. And mm -hmm. it really shouldn't make any difference. I mean, Abraham has pointed out attracting a castle is the same as attracting a button, and truly they are the same, except experientially. Mm. Experientially, they are not the same. They are quite different. But that's the layer of reality and truth. The truth is it is the same thing. Manifesting a million dollars or manifesting a dollar, it's exactly the same mm -hmm. in truth. But in reality, 
we have the layer of our stories that create this illusionary separation that stacks this pile of bricks underneath our vortex and stops that stuff falling into our life. Picking away at those stories requires being ready to let go of the gratification in terms of payoff, of the sense of self in terms of identity that we're invested in that contains those stories. When we're ready to do that, then we'll realize that it is just a finger snap and that's when we can have something new. But it does require letting go of this. And that letting go can be a real challenge. In the meantime, while you're letting go, you're also trying to figure out what you can figuratively hang on to with your fingernails. So mm. what do you what do you hang <laughs> on to? So this is what this is what the book really supports you in being able to do, being able to create that micro shifting experience in an empowered forward moving way and to create that alignment. So for example, when you're saying there's that separation between belief and acceptability. So parking spaces we accept that as being possible because we know it to be possible. We've had experience to know it's possible, but we can create those experiences on a number of different levels. We can create those experiences firsthand by micro shifting into similar experiences and chipping away at the, tr- at, at the, the stories. Secondhand, spending time with people, places and things that support the story that we want. And also you can use the power of the mind. That's one of the things I talk about in the book as well, using the power of the mind to create that experience within the mind because the mind doesn't know the difference between a real experience and an imagined one. So this is where visualization comes in. When you visualize with the fullness of your being, that experience happening in the first hand in your mind, you chip away at the story. It's where mental rehearsal works because mental rehearsal creates those grooves in the mind of possibility so that when you set that intention and line your frequency up, that gateway of experience is our belief, steps out of the way and allows it to show up for us. I'm curious to know whether this fits in with what you talked about in the book from your perspective. Um, from my perspective, one of the best rules of thumb I can follow when I am feeling reluctant about committing to that choice, because deep down, I doubt that the choice is actually going to work out, or I believe that it can't work out or something along that line. And that is to just follow one rule of thumb. Just do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Just, just do it anyway. And that has gotten me through a lot of really rough spots. I'm curious, how does that, does that fit in with what you teach in, in the book? Be deliberate in what you're choosing to do anyway. So push your edge and not your buttons is my phrase. Go to the edge of your experience, set an intention that's just beyond it and then just do it anyway. Mm. But go just beyond. Push it, celebrating, anchoring that new. So now you're, the bounds of what you consider to be truth and possible expand. And then you do that again, and then you do that again, and then you do that again, until your mind becomes so practiced in witnessing your boundaries being pushed that it no longer resists you asking for anything because all it's witnessed from you is you consciously bringing your awareness to setting an intention beyond what you believe is possible, achieving it, setting attention beyond and achieving it, setting an intention beyond and achieving it. That becomes the new norm. The autopilot now is positively polluted with experience. You pushing the boundaries of what's possible, moving on and creating that consistently time and time and time and time again. So we're touching on the second word in the title, beyond. Yeah. <laughs> beyond beyond is, is the key element here. Yeah. It's, it, it's a little bit further. It's, it's pushing. It's like being in the gym and do one more rep. It's one more. like being out on the track and running you know, one quarter mile more. It's, but then, sorry, someone just tried to call me. So we're setting, we're setting that, <laughs> we're setting that, um, <laughs> the difference is we write it down. It's like going to the gym and not writing down what you did last week. There's no cognitive connection between for you to move on, move on. It's like, um, uh, you, you're doing that, that one more rep. Well, how many reps have you done today? How many did you set out to do? Did you actually achieve it? That's where the difference is. Because if I haven't written it down or I haven't con- like made any record of it, then I, how can I know that I'm pushing my buttons the next week? I don't remember what I did. I haven't celebrated it. I haven't anchored that in my mind as possibility. It can then be a fluke or something that happened that one time. Versus, no, I set out to do that one more rep. I've done it. Here it is. And this is me celebrating it. And that's keeping yourself accountable. Yes, which is a, a piece that supports some people. Everyone's different. That's another important thing about my work. 
I recognize that everybody is different. We're yeah. all coming from different places, different experiences, different backgrounds, different stories, mm-hmm. but there are underlying truths that support creation, um, that support the creative process that we're all privy to, that we're all, um, we're all served by, but how we face, see, play with, and, and, and engage with that is going to be different for everyone. Mm-hmm. That's a challenge that any book writer has to face, mm-hmm. recognizing the fact that each of his readers is going to understand differently and apply differently and have different stories and then trying to write in a way that reaches all of them. I, I imagine that was one of the reasons why you went through so many revisions yourself, in addition to your own issues that you were bringing to the table. I'd say so, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that's, it, it's hard to overcome. I mean, well, that's a time for you to, to put your, your, practice into practice to actually Mm -hmm, do what you mm -hmm. practice what you preach. Right. Right. So so you, I imagine you actually had to do what you talked about in the book as part of writing the book. I I micro shifted. I set small targets. Um, I identified where my edge was. I identified what I had to do so I could bring that edge down. I identified what was pushing my buttons and brought in support in order to carry the other pieces. Um, I applied it and then, you know, the result is that the book is in it. Mm -hmm. Am I accurate in kind of not projecting, but um, it's not predicting because it's already happened. I don't know what the right adjective is, but am I <laughs> accurate in saying, let's put it that way. Am I accurate in saying that uh, you more effectively made your choice in the last lap of doing the book? Because that's when you really brought it all together. <sighs> I think I can agree with you there. Because that's when you were becoming most focused. I would say the the journey of the book and the integrity that I had to step into in order to bring it to life meant that I've reached a point where the energy aligned with what I wanted to do, the intention that I set, and then the time became perfect, and then it, mm-hmm. it went through. Yeah, it's always hard to know exactly how these things fold into themselves. Right. Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, I do think it's valuable to be looking at how did I get there? What did mm-hmm. I do? Because we want to be able to repeat these things. If you, you know, wash, rinse, repeat, that's the formula, right? You take your, whatever it is that's working and then you do it again and then you do it again and then you do it again. Is it wash, rinse, repeat or is it wash, rinse, pivot? Okay. Whatever, I'll ask it. <laughs> whatever floats your washing machine. I mean, really. <laughs> I have a very advanced washing machine. I can tell. (laughs) (laughs) That's the beauty of metaphors that you can make them be whatever you want them to be. If if that's the one that works and that's really the one that works. Mm -hmm. That goes back to the first thing that Dan said. It's about what you believe. Right, right. Truly, it really is all about what you believe. If you believe that you will attain enlightenment by standing on your head every morning for five hours at a time, then you... You will achieve enlightenment by standing on your head five hours a day. Mm-hmm. So that's just will happen. You know, personally, I pick other routes, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the blood rushing to my head. It's not a pretty sight. Yeah, I don't like that either. No, it's not a good <laughs> feeling. Because they will be real for you. <laughs> True. Yeah, they do become real. That's now, uh, I'm curious also, is this part of what you taught in the book? Uh, Abraham Hicks expresses it in terms of how a belief gets built up. It gets built up through the repetition. It gets built up by repeating it over and over again. And the more you repeat it, the more real it becomes. And the more real it becomes, the more you believe it. Is is that part of what you teach in your book? Not in the book um, so much, but in um, my program, Creating the Ideal Life, we actually dedicate a whole section to... So Creating the Ideal Life goes through the flow funnel, the four steps, of the, well, the four elements of the flow funnel, setting the intention creating the energetic alignment, creating the mindset alignment, and creating the action alignment. And yet in the, the mindset piece, we look at the three levels of mind uh, that we can actually access consciously in order to bring about an intention. So we look at beta, what we do in alpha, away from consciousness, what we do in alpha, relaxed away from what we do in beta, and stacking those so that we can create that group of belief so that we can actually experience it in our lives. So repetition beta level, at a theta level, you don't need to keep repeating it because you just drop it in. And alpha, you are doing some repetition, but not as much as repeating. 
writing it down a million times or whatever. But um, mm-hmm. repetition at beta level, the outer waking consciousness, to definitely support. You know. And I think looking at the way that they teach, they're probably giving something that the average man can do. Not everyone is going to go in alpha brain waves and what they mean and get into state and change their brain waves or whatever, or go and see hypno- hypnotists and access those states. Of, but everybody can repeat, right? Outer waking, con- outer waking consciousness. We all have, we, we use it every day. So it's something that we can, we can all do. So if you're doing it, it's a harder way, I think, really, because it takes more time because now you're, you're, you're giving the time element because you're, you're going, you're literally hard, right, hard writing over programs versus dipping in, changing the program at a root level and then working your way up and then following through with repetition to support it. So talk about that difference a little bit more. I, I presume that is part of what you got into in the book. So ex- explain that difference a little bit more. Like what, really how, how, how do we understand that? Hmm? I don't really get this book at all because it is, it is quite, uh, it's more a meaty, more meaty topic to, to delve into. But suffice to say that we have different levels of our mind. The mind's operating at different, different levels. And you can support change in your belief systems on those different levels using different tactics. So repetition works on outer waking consciousness. You can use incantations, um, affirmations in a space of, in a state of relaxed awareness that works in the alpha state. Um, visualization is more of an alpha into beta. Hypnosis, uh, rapid transfer therapy, and other sort of deep rooted uh, subconscious programming t- tactics work on there. So we've got these different levels of the mind that we can access in order to get the outcome. Okay. So, all right, well then let's go back to the book again and tell us a, uh, tell us another story from the book. Cause we like stories. So let's go for a story. Uh, what's another story from the book? Um, oh, I told a very embarrassing story that was really hilarious, um, but not really hilarious at the same time. Uh, I, I used to have a more full-time travel assistant. She used to book all my flights for me. So I tell her where I need to go, when I need to be there, where I'm leaving from, whatever, whatever. If there's a budget for it. So for example, if I'm getting reimbursed or whatever, I give her that. And she'd give, she'd send me a load of flights and say, which one do I want? She books it. And then I just show up at the airport, get on the plane and go. She's German. Very, very, very efficient. So I was due to go up to Toronto to be on a, a, a TV show. And, um, um, I got to the to the airport, and uh, where did I get to? I think it was La, LaGuardia. LaGuardia, I think I got to LaGuardia Airport. And uh, I get to the desk, and they're like, oh, sorry, we can't find you. <laughs> so I thought, okay, it's a partner airline. So I, I went around and looked for the partner airline. And I said, well, I'm looking at the, the flight time, looking at the flight's real, I've got the flight number, I've got that information. But I didn't actually have my confirmation because I never get my confirmation from Julia. I don't bother right. asking her because she's mm-hmm. effectively German. I just show up, get on the plane and go. <laughs> like, I just literally show up, give her my passport and done. Anyway, manager comes down, searches the entire flight manifest for the flight. Sorry, you're not on the flight. Mm. Confused, I don't know what's going on here. Can I get on the flight? No, sorry, the flight's full. We can't, we can't put you on the flight. Oh, okay. no. So anyway, um, it's now two o'clock in the morning for Julia, so I can't even get any help from her to get the information, the confirmation. I can't get any of that stuff. And that's when I realized what had happened. I'd gone to the wrong airport. Yeah. Oh, no. Because I confirmed with her, or I miscommunicated which flight I confirmed. Uh-huh. The flight I was due to be on had left an hour before. Oh, no. <laughs> I said, call the night before the interview. Sorry, I'm not going to be able to get there in time. Wow. Went back to, to New York, um, to back to Brooklyn, went home. And, and the funny thing was, and this is the funny thing. When I'd initially done the draft of the book, I'd made up an imaginary story about a guy called Tom mm-hmm. who'd gone to the wrong end. This is an analogy I use all the time for specific piece of your intention the analogy of being at the wrong airport for the right at the right time for the wrong plane and expecting yourself to be able to get there and it's about knowing where you are and accepting where you are in order to get to where you want to go i can't get from florida to new york if i'm standing in cincinnati waiting for the florida flight i have to accept i'm in cincinnati my flight leaves from florida i must be in florida if i want to get to new york or 
I'm in Cincinnati. I can get an effective route from Cincinnati to New York. I'm not in Florida as much as I'd love to be there. I can pretend, close my eyes and visualize being in Florida. I can make a, a, a mind movie and a vision board about what it would be like to be in Florida. But I'm in Cincinnati. I have to own that in order to get to New York. Mm. And then there I was in the middle of getting this last draft ready, right. living out the story that I told as an example mm. of being in the wrong place and not able to get to my destination. So own where you're at if you want to get to where you, where you want to go because it's only from where we're at that we can effectively, effectively create the right route to getting to our destination. Right. Well, that, that seems like a good place to stop because we're actually a few minutes over. And I say it's a good place to stop because when Louise and I went from here to Florida for our trip, we had a stopover in, you guessed it, Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> and we definitely had to own being in Cincinnati, Cincinnati. because that's where we had dinner. You know, so. <laughs> you know what the funny thing is, Walt? I don't know why I said Cincinnati. I was gonna say- <laughs> Ooh, okay. <laughs> Nashville was in my head. Nashville was in my head. Mm. Wow. I well, wasn't going to. I was going to use something else as well. So, anyway, on, on behalf of the podcast, I would like to thank your subconscious mind for giving me such a nice segue. I really appreciate that so much. <laughs> And thank you also for sharing about your book. We'll have to go into the book a little bit more detail, especially uh, what you talk about in later chapters. So let's let's pick that up um, next Thursday and see if we can pick up some more but good stuff. And congratulations once more to Alex, who is thank now an you. Inky woman with well, a ring on her finger. Now. <laughs> Very exciting news. Hopefully yes. uh, listeners will say to themselves, you know what? This stuff really does work. It worked for Alex. How about that? Sure does. Yeah. So thank you guys very much. Thank you listeners. Thank you uh, live streamers as well. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.